Welcome back to Girls Next Level, guys. Yeah, part two. <laughs> How are you feeling today? I feel, well, it's so rainy here in LA. It makes me in major cozy mode. I didn't want to get out of bed this morning. Oh my God, girl, I am dragging ass. Like, I thought I went to bed, you know, early enough last night to get up early and do what I need to do today. I did not. <laughs> uh, so I'm just pulling the energy out of my butthole right now. <laughs> I don't Uh-oh. Know what to do. <laughs> well, I am... Um, I definitely went to bed a little bit earlier because I knew I wanted to get up in time to like do all my normal stuff uh-huh. and then and then get here early enough to like record everything we had to record today. But when my alarm went off this morning, I was like, oh, me too. <laughs> I like hit the snooze. I reset the alarm like three times. I turned on a podcast while I'm laying in bed trying to wake up just it was bad. I was thinking, would Holly kill me if I rescheduled? It is raining. <laughs> it's raining in LA. So that means we get to stay home. <laughs> yeah. Just if you guys don't know, if you're not from LA or haven't spent time here, when it rains here, people kind of like, just don't do anything. It's like such a rare thing when it rains this much. It's like people are calling in sick to work. Yeah, for sure. They're just like not doing stuff. Yeah. Life is over. It's rain. There's drops in the sky. We don't know what that is. This yeah. wet stuff coming from the sky and we better just stay home to be safe. <laughs> totally what people do you know what I have to tell you guys so I sent Bridget this TikTok the other night because I was scrolling through TikTok and somebody posted it was like a commercial for some compilation CD and they said it was from 2003 but this first song on it just sent me back to a place I did not want to go because the first song on this was I Turn to You by Mel C the former Spice Girl random But just so you guys know, when we would go into the bedroom with Hef at the end of a club night, the first thing he would do was walk over to one side of the bed and press play on his CD player. And there was this one mix CD. Now, we changed it up later on, you know, down the road to stuff we liked better, stuff we thought was funny or whatever. But somebody at some point came up with this mix CD and the very first song that was playing every night as you're walking into the bedroom, I'm already dissociating, I'm turning on the bathtub. But anyway, so it was always like Mel C, I Turn To You was playing. And I just think that's so funny because I don't know if anybody out there has it in their head what they think Hugh Hefner listened to in the bedroom, but I don't think anyone would guess Mel C. Spice Girl. You know what? I'm not sure that anyone necessarily, or maybe we talked about it when we talked about in the bedroom, but I don't know that anyone ever thought about music playing maybe because we talk about the pornos playing. Mm -hmm. So they may not have thought that there was music playing, but the pornos were like on mute or like really, really low. And the room was blasting with like really loud music. Yeah. And it was like early 2000s, like poppy techno-ish stuff. I'm going to repost this TikTok and nobody who follows me on TikTok is going to know except for you guys. And I'm going to green screen myself in front of it with a horrified face, horrified look on my face. (laughs) And you guys can just know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Because I saw that and I was sent back to a place I did not want to (laughs) go. Well, our last um, episode ended with, uh, I think, uh, Audra getting into the bunny suits Mm -hmm. and taking the photo um, for Operation Playmate. Yeah, and kind of like the natural halfway point of that episode goes from that, all the bunny costume stuff, to you going to Fort Bragg to visit your brother. And we actually have an interview with Eddie coming up. We get to hear the stories from the source. But before we get into that, just tell everybody about like what your expectations from the trip were or what you wanted it to be and all your packing and anything you had to do before you got out there? Well, I knew it was going to be super quick. And like I've mentioned before, um, I was super excited to take the the care package directly to my brother and see where he was at. And it had been a long time since I'd seen him too. And my sister was with me. So we were excited about that. But I also was picking up my dog on the way back. So there was a lot to pack for and a lot to bring and a lot to think about all like really pushed into this short amount of time. Plus, I think this is the first time I'm really like traveling with like the show kind of other than like I mean I know we did Vegas but like this is this is different this is like a all eyes are on you yeah you have you're holding all the pressure (laughs) yeah and all by myself and I think I also mentioned already too that um Kevin our executive producer didn't put a lot of thought into this whole trip it was sort of like nah he didn't even want to film any of it and then he thought oh I think he filmed it more because of getting the dog yeah and he wanted to document that 
Um, but when we got there, like there's also, you know, more people now. There's my sister and me and my brother and stuff. So he had to end up hiring like a, a local crew to help mm-hmm. cover it because one producer yeah. can't do <laughs> all of that with like a little tiny handheld camera. So he did end up hiring that, but only out of necessity, not because he like thought that the scene was so important. Later in life, he will um, he will concede on that and say that he didn't realize the importance of like the scene and es- establishing my brother and establishing his military career and that kind of stuff. But later he saw it. So I'm glad he did eventually see it because I think it's very, very important to show. And I could not believe at the time that he wasn't taking it very seriously or didn't think it was such a, a cool opportunity to show that whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it was so important just from like a relatability standpoint, just to like show your family and your brother in the military. It's also kind of cool because it's like the opposite of what you'd expect when you're watching like a Playboy Mansion show. And that's always fun to see opposites. It's fun to see a contrast. And I think it was so important as far as like fans embracing the show to show your family and like the family side. And I don't think the show would have succeeded without that element. Yeah, well, and how normal and not that being in the army is normal, but how normal my family is Mm -hmm. too. You know what I mean? Like we might be at this crazy mansion and having this crazy lifestyle and stuff, but the rest of my family is normal. And I think being in the military is very honorable. And I thought it was just so weird that he didn't want to you know, film it. So I'm glad it all worked out. But um, the first scene is me packing. And your honky tonk music is back. That's what I was going to (laughs) say. The banjo music. Why? It's so weird. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I am from Northern California, but yeah, I think that was their thing is like Bridget's like the small town country girl. But I don't think that's your music. You needed like a 60s bubble pop, I think. Yeah, like I didn't even know what my music should have been, but I was like banjo, like deliverance style music. (laughs) (laughs) Gizmo is hilarious. Oh. Just her look, her, I want to call it her reaction shot, even though she's probably not reacting to anything, but it looks like she is. It's a reminder that I didn't have Wednesday yet, but they added her in the editing and I think it's important to note that here to show how tricky the editors can be like you would never know that the dog wasn't already there yeah the juicy dog bag is back and it's annoying because I feel like it looks like I got this brand new like puppy that barely opens its eyes yet and I'm leaving it yeah and I feel like that's so rude I was like I would never leave that little puppy it would either come with me or I wouldn't be going right now like I'd be like I can't I have a newborn at home (laughs) (laughs) but um and it's also why um I'm in the limo and I'm like I'm gonna miss gizmo so much and saying that over and over again but I never mention Wednesday I'm not gonna miss the brand new puppy I just got yeah because I don't have her yet they should have had you do a voiceover I'm surprised they didn't think of that I think they just I don't know. Either he didn't think it through or he just thought it's funny to show that I only care about Gizmo. I got this new puppy, but I only care about Gizmo. I don't know. I feel like they're still like running and playing catch up with this show because Kevin had never done a reality show before. And, you know, like we've said in previous episodes, like the show started filming in May, like late May, and it was supposed to be on the air in early August. So they are scrambling. I'm kind of shocked they have episodes as good as they do this quickly, but there's a lot of holes. And I think this is probably one of them. Yeah. But as you mentioned, I do love that the juicy dog bag gets another, uh, cause it's so cute. It is cute. It's so shot. Y2K. And I'm talking to my brother on the phone. They'd always make us do that. Like make a phone call to like set up what's the scene that's going to be happening. So I'm sure they were like, can you get your brother on the phone and talk about what you guys are going to do? And if he's excited about you coming and like all that kind of stuff. Cause those were the kinds of things they would like make us do. And they usually were already done. So it was just for show. Yeah. <laughs> reenactment yeah <laughs> all of our families were probably like what the fuck is going on yeah <laughs> what are we I know doing? you're coming Fake what do you combo? mean how do, what yeah. do you mean how do I feel about you coming <laughs> <laughs> and then okay the next scene is I was cringing watching this okay everyone including Hef comes to my room to say goodbye and I just feel like this scene was so awkward. Oh, is it what I think it is? Because I have it in my notes, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. No, 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 it is. It is. It is. I, I, I'm cringing, too. 
And when everybody comes barging in with the cameras, which I mean, I don't, it doesn't seem like I knew that they were necessarily coming in right this minute. I'm sure I knew we were going to do this scene, but I didn't necessarily have like a time schedule when things were going to be done. And my sister was changing. So she hears everybody come running into the bedroom. So she runs into the bathroom to finish changing. I say to Hef, who comes, you know, walking into the room, that, oh, I kind of stop everybody from coming any further because I say, Anastasia's naked. And Hef does this weird little, like, giddy dance. Like a gallop. Yeah, like, ooh, goody. And I was, and I know that he was just kind of joking, or I took it as he was just joking, but it still did not look good. And rewatching it now made me cringe and feel so yuck. No, I know exactly what you mean, because that kind of shit was so embarrassing. Like in the moment, I think when it's happening, I'm probably standing back there like nervous laughing. But he would do shit like that. And we have other episodes where he does kind of weird shit like that, too, that we'll point out later. But it was like he had no boundaries as far as like age or family or appropriateness. Not that he was trying to like get with Anastasia in real life, but it's like it's not funny. Yeah. And to clarify, because I've been asked this many times, did I like feel uh, weird about bringing my sister there? Was I ever worried that anything was going on or that anything would happen to her or whatever? And the answer is never. Like I never thought that um, Hef had any interest in her whatsoever as far as like, you know, girlfriend or trying to get with her or that she was in any kind of danger at all and I never felt Anastasia had any desire to be a part of any of that at at all either and it was always just her being my sister and being there for that reason but I do think that Hef thought it was cute and funny to like go oh somebody's naked not not even thinking about it being like my younger sister just anybody if anybody would have been naked in the other room he would have done that little gallop and like been all excited because he thought that that was cute and funny but rewatching it now I'm just like that wasn't cute or funny it's not on so many levels it's it's just like it blows my mind and like you said it wasn't like he I I never once thought like he was trying to like see Anastasia naked in real life or anything yeah. like that he just thought it was funny yeah and it's just ugh. and you guys are staying standing off by the side which also looks really awkward you guys are like way off yeah. by the bookcase which is like by the door like by Gizmo's tree like really giving space not walking all the way into the room because somebody is in the other side of the room changing I'm sure Anastasia shut the bathroom door so there was no danger but mm-hmm. like I think she was still running to the ba- the bathroom when you guys were walking in so like yeah. you know you guys stayed off and then it just but it just the whole scene looks awkward the whole scene was like you and Kendra like just standing off to the side not coming in any further Hef like galloping towards me and I don't know the whole thing is just so cringy It's so bad. And it reminds me of this story. And this is a gossip story, which I always want to make it clear when I tell a story, if it's just something I've heard secondhand, like this wasn't something I witnessed. So I don't really know if it's true. But in the very early days of me being at the mansion, the recruiter said to me something like when this other girl was here, I'm not going to say her name, but it was this other playmate that Hef was dating in like the original seven, like in his original seven lineup. I guess that woman's mother came to stay and like went out to the club with them and stuff and this girl told me that Hef tried to get the girl's mom to come into the bedroom ew I know and the mom was kind of like young and cute so I kind of don't disbelieve it as gross as I think that is I still feel like it's grosser to go over after the little sister too (laughs) one thousand percent it's just at least the other two are like older consenting adults yeah you know And I don't know why I'm really surprised because this is a guy who would date twins at the same time, but it is grosser to go after an underage person Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's gross. Yeah. It's disgusting. But again, I do want to reiterate, like I never felt like Anastasia was any kind of danger or like... Yeah, you wouldn't have had her there if you thought Never, never. And we will have her on in an interview coming up, so we'll see how she felt about all of that. But I never felt that... She was, or I never would have had her there. Yeah, and you know what's weird? It's like we didn't feel like that in day-to-day life, but he'll whip out a behavior like that on camera, which I felt like was extra like humiliating and embarrassing because this is the guy that I'm supposed to be in love with and think is like a great person, which I did at the time. But then sometimes the cameras would be rolling and it's like Anastasia's naked and he starts galloping and I'm like, ha, 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 ha. 
Yeah. Or like he's trying to steal Kendra's baby videos at her mom's house. And I'm like, uh, and like these kind of behaviors would come out on camera. And I'm like, who is this person? Again, though, like, and I don't know, and I'm not trying to stick up for him. I honestly just thought he thought he was being funny. I think he did, too. But also, like, you have to get to a point where you're like, this involves, like, some underage people. I know. Like, and yeah. it's just like, are you fucking warped? And he probably was because he'd spent, like, most of his adult life being surrounded by, like, yes people who are, like, laughing. Like, I always think if anybody out there watched The Sopranos, there's that episode of The Sopranos where I think it's Tony Soprano's therapist is talking about how, like, when you're the person in power, everybody around you laughs at your jokes, whether you're funny or not. So then he's paranoid. And anytime his friends laugh at his jokes, he's, like, kind of glaring, like, <laughs> what the fuck? And I feel like that was Hef's life, too. But at the same time, like he's supposedly this genius IQ, really intelligent, supposed to be a leader, supposed to be a trendsetter. Like, get it together, bro. Yeah. So then we have this sad, sappy scene where I'm saying goodbye as if I'm leaving for months. I know. (laughs) I'm like, I'm not even going to miss buffet dinner. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) What time did you guys leave? It looked so early. Honestly, I don't remember at all. We always had to leave early, though, because it was always like, how much can we fit into like the least amount of days? Yeah. And I think usually, I mean, even um, like flying to Boston now to visit Anastasia or whatever, I usually the flights are usually really early in the morning. Well, yeah, because you have the time change Mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. So I'm sure we had to be at LAX at like six in the morning or something like that. Which means if your flight leaves at six, leave at four in the morning. Yeah, we would have to leave the mansion at probably three thirty or four in the morning I mean the flight might have been at seven I don't know but we probably yeah, had to leave around four in the morning because it's not close and there's LA traffic and you know what just um you being in your room with Gizmo reminded me of I don't know if you remember this or if you even saw it but back when the show came out somebody made a parody of the show on YouTube and this was back when YouTube was brand new and there's probably like 10 videos total on YouTube but somebody made a parody of Girls Next Door with Barbies And they only made one scene of it. And I was kind of disappointed they didn't keep going. But the one scene they had was like a parody of you and Gizmo. They had a Barbie dressed up as you. And you're chasing Gizmo around the room. And Gizmo's like freaking out and scratching. And And then Gizmo's like in your hair. And it's like, and it was really funny. And I was bummed that they never made more. And I tried to look it up to see if it was still on YouTube. It's not. I don't even think I know about it. Yeah. I only saw it because like somebody sent it to Hef and he like played it in his room. That's so funny. Well, it's funny that you say that now, too, because like I'm talking about how in the next scene I'm totally mauling Gizmo. And it's because (laughs) in in one part I'm going to miss her because I am going to be gone for a few days. But more so because I know that when I come back, I'm bringing a new puppy and I'm going to forever change her life. And then it shows you walking out and we have the whiteboards next to our doors. And we probably mentioned this, but I don't remember. We were expected to write where we were going and when we would be back on the whiteboard. So that if Mm -hmm. Hef was looking for us, he could be like, oh, out running errands. I assume she'll be back by dinner time or whatever. Yeah. And you wrote, what did you write? North Carolina or bust? Yeah. And you know what's funny about the origin of that saying? Because I think you guys are asking about well, where did Anastasia's it come from? like, or bust. Like, she doesn't know what that means. No, you know where it came from is it came from, like, the Dust Bowl. Because people were, like, farming in Oklahoma. And then the Dust Bowl came. They had nothing. So they would literally, like, in the Great Depression, have to pile all their furniture and shit on their cars. And people would make signs that said California or bust. Oregon or bust. Because they literally had to make it somewhere else. And start new or bust like they were fucking done I had no idea that was the origin you know (laughs) do you want to know what the origin was for me boobs no (laughs) no what was the origin spring break we would like use those markers and put it on our wind or our um, back whatever you call the back shield (laughs) the the rear view view. window I know know. (laughs) we're not awake this morning um and we would write like Palm Springs or bust or yeah. Santa Cruz or bust. Yeah. And so my sister didn't know what that meant. I was like, what? How do you not know? You know, another interesting observation Archie is laying outside of my door. And I never thought about this before until I started going through scrapbooks and trying to pull stuff for the for this podcast. Archie was around me a lot. He used to, uh, and on so many pictures when we're sitting at the dining room table, he is sitting behind my chair. Interesting. And he's outside my door. He's like in the, in the, in several shots on Girls Next Door. 
And like, um, but so many pictures when we're getting ready, when we're either eating dinner in the dining room or getting ready to go out to the club, Archie's like behind my door. And I never realized how much he like kind of glommed onto where I was until I'm looking back at these pictures and I'm thinking, why is Archie always like beside my chair or outside my door? Or And I don't see it on other photos with other people. That's so interesting. He must have felt a kinship. Yeah, I don't know because, I mean, obviously I cared about Archie. He was one of the mm-hmm. house dogs, but I never felt like this emotion super tight emotional attachment towards yeah. him or anything and god forbid i didn't ever invite him in my room or anything because he pees on everything and i the one thing i do remember though that archie must have been around me quite a bit farting is the insane dog farts you know what's crazy is the dog farts were really bad and he would go into the movie room when half would show his movies and <laughs> it would be really bad. Like, it would be disruptive. And Dickie Ban used to tell me, Kimberly used to light a match when Ugh. Archie farted. So I go, okay, I'll, I'll take, I'll gladly take over that, like, to make people feel better. So I would bring matches into the movie room and light a match if he farted to take it away. And Hef got pissed at me. Like, he didn't want me to do, I'm like, what? You just want your guests to sit here in the foul stench? Oh, it was so bad. He was like the worst offender of farts. Do you want to hear another <laughs> another gross story? Sorry, Archie, sorry is. if anybody, if any of you guys are like trying to eat. This is so bad. But like on the topic of like picking up dog shit and stuff. Oof. One time Archie took a giant shit in the hallway. I don't know why I'm whispering it. Like you guys <laughs> can't hear me. Like this is audible case, only, but just in case anyone else is listening. <laughs> yeah. In case anybody's as if it's going to make anybody less grossed out if I whisper it. So he took this giant shit in the hallway and I'm like, and it like the smell was like going through the whole house overpowering. I had to take an empty shoe box to scoop this up with the shoe box lid. Cause it was so much. And I had to hold my breath. I was like dying of oxygen deprivation cause I was gagging. Oh, and then I like threw it in the outdoor garb. It was the most intense. Like, I think one of the reasons that I've never adopted a big dog since then is I'm like, what if they have an accident like that? <laughs> you had to plot like the whole hazmat suit. I I know it was in, it was a lot but don't say I didn't ever pick up dog shit you guys because it happened frequently yeah so um this next section that I'm talking about here actually we talk about with my brother in an interview the interview we did all right let's get to Eddie okay so we have a very special guest with us today. We have Eddie, Bridget's brother. And Bridget, you've told me a little bit about some of the stories Eddie has. So I'm going to let you take it away with this interview. I'm so excited to hear the stories firsthand. And I know everybody else is too. Yay. Eddie, thanks so much for doing this today. So I'm going to take you back to the first time that um, you were on the show. We decided that I would take your care package directly to you because you were stateside in Fort Bragg. Tell everybody what you were doing at Fort Fort Bragg. Um, I had just uh, gotten to Fort Bragg. I was stationed to the 82nd Airborne Division, um, and I had just um, gotten there a few months prior to that. I was at Fort Benning uh, in January 2005, going through uh, paratrooper training, uh, airborne training, uh, infantry training, um, and then got to Fort Bragg probably about April of 2005. And at this point, you had already done, in my um, my notes for the episode, I have that you had already done two tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, right? Yeah, I, I just just come off of a year in Iraq before going to the training. So all of 2004, I was deployed. And then uh, I was in my reenlistment window. So I uh, reclassed to infantry and um, wound up having to go to Fort Benning um, in January of 2005 to, for that training. So um, tell everyone, I've talked about your story before, but um, I want to tell everyone how you got in the army in the first place, because you had a totally different occupation plan. So you were going to do makeup special effects. Yeah, I yeah, I'd always wanted to do special effects since I was a, a kid. Um, at the time, I had just gotten my uh, embalmer's license, finished all the things I needed to do for the California embalmer's license, and uh, was looking for my next adventure. And that that was uh, that, that's where I was headed. Yeah. So I remember we went like I think we even paid part of the tuition and everything like you were enrolled, you were going. But yeah, we spent the summer, you and I going to uh, Pennsylvania to see the school and, and meet with Tom Savini, which that was awesome for me because I, I grew up watching his stuff and, you know, I was a huge 
huge fan of his. There were schools right there in California I could have done, but when I knew that he was opening the school, that, that had to be the one. Yeah. So things got sidetracked when 9-11 happened. Yeah, I was I was supposed to start school in, in October once 9-11 happened and things started progressing from there. And it looked like we were definitely uh, going to have a... a a war response to what happened. Yeah, I just kind of lost sight of everything else and and wanted to, to go and do my part. And so um, you enroll in the Army. I remember going to uh, St. Louis for your boot camp graduation. Yeah. And then where'd you go from there? From there, I went to uh, Fort Lee, Virginia for Mortuary Affairs AIT, uh, Advanced Individual Training, where you actually learn your, your Army job. And the only active duty um, company of Mortuary Affairs Specialists in the Army at the time was the 54th Quartermaster, and they were stationed there at Fort Lee. So I ended up getting stationed there as well. And then they send you to Iraq to do mortuary affairs there. I went to Afghanistan for seven months oh. first in 02 and 03. And while I was in Afghanistan, we uh, invaded Iraq. So, yeah, our, our replacements were late. We were there a month longer than we were supposed to be. But the whole company deployed for, for the Iraqi freedom operation. Um, so I got, got stuck in Afghanistan for a month longer than I should have. But, um, you know, when, when I came home from Afghanistan, I immediately wanted to go to Iraq and they were already looking for replacements for the guys in Iraq. So six months later, I wound up in Iraq and I think we left in October, or November of 03. And at the end of the, that first six months in Iraq, I decided to stay for another six months. I uh, had a grand total of a, a year in Iraq at that point. And your, I don't know if you call it company, was responsible for evacuating how many remains? I think while I was in Afghanistan, we, we took care of, um, of 40. And that was a combination of um, everybody. We, we didn't just handle U.S. personnel. We, we handled uh, coalition forces. We handled some local uh, nationals, Af Afghanis, and, and sometimes even the, the enemy. But Iraq, so that was Afghanistan, about 40. And then Iraq... Um, probably about 500 while I was there. Wow. That's crazy. So you're doing all this stuff, heroic, amazing stuff. And um, I am moving into the mansion. What were your <laughs> thoughts on that? My thoughts was I'm, I'm missing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what I'm sacrificing. I, I could, I could be down in because part of the plan was by going to Tom Savini's school was to, go to LA with you. Cause I think your trajectory at that time was already heading that direction in 2001. Yeah. So I think that was part of the plan was to go down there and, and hang out with you and we, we could do Southern California together and conquer and, and all the rest of it. Obviously that's the direction you went and I kind of deviated just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> um, that was what I was thinking the whole time was, well, I guess I'm missing the boat on that one. <laughs> uh, it would have been so fun too. I know it. I know it. What were your thoughts when we started filming a TV show? Like, were you too preoccupied with everything that else was going on? Like, you're like, I don't know what she's even talking about. Or were you like, that's crazy? A little of both. You know, I, I don't think I saw the first episode. I don't think I saw the show at all before I was even on it. Because like you said, we were at the sixth episode and I was just, you know, uh, in and out of country and training and, and all those things. And then, you know, I didn't have cable in my barracks room at the at Fort Bragg. So, yeah, I don't even think I saw any episodes um, before I was before you came to North Carolina. So I didn't really know what to think. You know, I, I didn't know how big of a deal it was was or was going to be or, or anything like that. Neither did we, <laughs> no, <laughs> especially not at that point. We didn't even know what we were doing. Yeah. Everything was just like new. We, I don't even think we'd seen an episode yet either by the time I went. No, there. no way. Not even a rough cut. I call you and I say, we want to come to Fort Bragg, the TV show. We want to bring you this care package. What were your first thoughts? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that was honestly my first thought because I, um, the, 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 what I, what you said was that. And what I heard was, I need you to facilitate that. And I'm thinking, I don't know anybody here. I have no friends here. It's not like I can just, you know, walk up to the chain of command or Fort Bragg PR or whatever and, and try to set this up from the inside. And I was, I was just thinking, I, how the hell am I going to, because, because I think we were talking about an event at first you know, with lots of troops and a big stage and, and whatever, you know, we, we were thinking of an assembly type of thing. And I'm thinking I, I can barely find my room, 
you know. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah. who did you have to ask? Well, I, I think um, what, was it the producers of the show that actually reached out to the PR people at Fort Bragg? Po- probably that's their job. Yeah, because I hadn't really run it up the flagpole at all at that point. And next thing I know, first sergeant is calling me on my cell phone, which. That, that's a red flag. It, you know, I, I had his number saved and I saw his number come up and I was like, oh my God, what did I do? And as if that wasn't intimidating enough, he's talking about, I need to come back to base right now because this is already after hours. This is after five o'clock. Like we'd all been released for the day. And he said, I need to come back right now, meet him in his office because the brigade sergeant major wants to see us. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what is this about? So probably six o'clock at night and we're knocking on uh, Sergeant Major's door. <laughs> but, and he's a scary guy, right? Well, to me, he was, you know, I was brand new to the 82nd and his name was uh, Sergeant Major Lambert. We called him Sergeant Major Debo based on a character of the Friday movies. I forget. I think it's Terry Crews that pra- plays him. Just huge, muscular dude. But, you know, Sergeant Majors being Sergeant Majors, all they're concerned about are standards. And if you're not meeting the standard, which you're never meeting the standard, but you don't want a Sergeant Major to correct you. And you sure as hell don't want to be standing in his office. And, you know, there I was. I I, I had no idea what the hell was going on, why I was there or anything. You know, we're, we're standing in front of his desk, just like in the movies, you know, hands behind our back, parade rest. And he's sitting behind his desk and barking at us. Basically, he said, the 82nd Airborne will not be associated with Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I look, first Sarah and I look at each other we're like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I, I see where this is going. He goes, yeah, you know, what, what, and the conversation kind of went hazy from there, but, but basically he was saying, we are not bringing Playboy and TV crews onto Fort Bragg for a impromptu session with a Playboy bunny or, or whatever, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. Roger that. And that, that was the definitive word. I don't know <laughs> yeah. how it got to him. I don't know why he felt he had to drag us into the office to tell us that, but yeah. So I was a little relieved that that's all it was. I was, I was also relieved that that kind of took care of itself. <laughs> I didn't have to, you know, figure that out. So, yeah, we uh, we definitely had to come up with a plan B for you. There was a, a local restaurant that was nice enough to let us film there. And we just spread the word around if anybody wanted to show up that we would be there. And we had care packages and I would sign autographs and filming for a show and that kind of thing. And um, at first it was just you and a couple of friends. It doesn't really show too much, but I know that when we got there, I did take a, a picture with the Fort Bragg sign and we did get to go on base, but they don't sh- obviously don't show that because the cameras weren't allowed and we got to do stuff. We got to see your barracks and go um, walk around and see everything. I think we did. I say in the commentary that we did museums like Fort Bragg museums or something. Yeah, we, we checked it out and. You guys were just there for a day or two, right? I think a day. Like, it was fast. Like, Hef didn't let us be gone for very long. So, like, we had to fly there, film it, and fly home. (laughs) They didn't get out. (laughs) Yeah. So, I think the total was, like, three days. But one day was flying there, one day was being there, and one day was flying home. The the Big Apple was where we ended up filming at. They they have a, um, a separate cigar bar that wasn't open that night where they let us hang out. And so we, we were in there, but then uh, you decided you want to do a, a, a lap around the sports bar part of it. So the, they had their security lead you through. It was kind of funny watching you behind their security guard, just walking through the sports bar in a bunny outfit. <laughs> Nobody had any idea what the hell was going on. <laughs> <laughs> With a camera crew in tow. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? They don't show any of that, and they don't show like all the the people that did finally show up. They only just show that like small gathering of like you and like two friends and and me and you teaching me to salute, which I still can't do. Right? Yeah, we're past that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then in my interview, it shows me still trying to do the salute, and I can tell I'm doing it all wrong because I'm like this. It's like this, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Either you're a bad soldier, or I'm a bad teacher. I'm, I'm not sure which. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the other thing, and I would not have remembered this except for I say it in commentary. The day we arrive just happens to be the day of the London bombing. 
And I don't know exactly the details of which London bombing that was, but I just, I say it in commentary. I was like, oh, and then security was extra tight when we got there because it was the morning of the London bombing. Wow. Yeah. I'm out of the loop on that one. Yeah. It's crazy how many like bombings and tragedies and things just happen on a regular basis. Cause you said London bombing and I'm sure it was a huge deal then, but I'm like thinking like there's like a million, you get, it's crazy. I know. It's like, I can't even think of which one that was. And I'm sure it was huge at the time. Yeah. You, you lose track of these things. You know, there's like Holly said, just so many of them, you know, here we are what, 15 years later and it's just, there's so much has happened since then. Yeah. yeah. So it was like we said, it was quick. What was filming like for you? Were you a natural at it? Were you self-conscious? Were you like, this is weird? <laughs> I, I'm definitely not a natural at it. It was weird. It, what, what was weird about it, I think initially was um, when we were all sitting around at the table talking, we, you know, army guys can only discuss army things sometimes. And so we kept telling the producer, you can't use that. <laughs> can't use that. <laughs> oh, I do remember that. Confidential yeah. information. Well, I think we were just talking shit. I don't think it was anything. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I did not remember this, but when I was talking to you the other day on the phone, and this is kind of what inspired us to be like, no, Eddie has to come on and tell the story himself. You told me that this episode actually aired in September, but not just in September. It actually aired on September 11th, which is crazy. It is. You know, the other part of that coin was um, we were in New Orleans at the time. And tell everybody why you were in New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina had just come through um, in August, uh, Labor Day weekend. We got recalled from our um, weekend passes to deploy to New Orleans. Shit was hitting the fan there and they needed uh, security elements basically to stop. So they evacuated. They evacuated the French Quarter and they needed you guys to come and like make sure it stayed evacuated. Right. Well, they evacuated the whole city. There was two battalions from the 82nd and I think there was a, a... a unit from the first cav, lots of national guard. Our job was to patrol different sectors of the city. And we, we had the area just North of the French quarter. And that, that was a trip. That was a trip because you see a, you know, major American city just completely evacuated and void of any power life of anything going on. Everything's just stopped. It was so extreme. Like we went there a little over two years later and it felt like we had come like the next day. Like it was still, you know, there were still neighborhoods wiped out and everybody was still kind of reeling from the whole thing. And you know what's crazy about New Orleans too, um, being, like you said, kind of lifeless, like everybody being evacuated and everything. Like that city is so full of life. I mean, I know every city is, but especially New Orleans, like it has a vibe to it. It has like a more than just a people energy. Like it has a spiritual energy there. Like there's just so much there. So I can't even imagine what it would have felt like to be there without anybody there it's just kind of eerie i feel like well the only thing left was spiritual because you you have a ghost story Ooh, tell us yeah well it might be a ghost story certainly was at the time we were on a night patrol and we were outside of a uh, a building that was either horribly damaged or was under construction when the hurricane came through i think it was under construction whatever the case was it was kind of you know the windows weren't in dilapidated and we heard people inside the building and you know part of our job was to make sure that there were no people inside the buildings so we carried our rifles and we had one magazine of ammunition because you know these are american citizens we're not not going down there for combat but we do have the right to protect ourselves because there were armed people walking around so we were getting ready to go in the building my my squad leader and i and we um, put magazines in our rifles just to be safe took out our, our flashlights and went in and we're following the voices upstairs. And as soon as we got upstairs, the voices stopped and we cleared the entire building and there was no one there. Whoa. Ooh, that's creepy. Gives me chills. Yeah. Especially just picturing the atmosphere and everything. Oh yeah. I mean, to tell the story is one thing, but to, to be there and just in that complete desolation was, you know, we didn't think much of it at the time, but um, looking back, it was like, wow, what was that? <laughs> you know? Right. It's insane. Okay. So you're in, you're in um, New Orleans and you guys are like sleeping in like a parking garage, right? Yeah. Well, we thought when we got there, this wasn't going to be too bad because you guys are staying at the Marine Reserve barracks in, in the city and we get there. And what they meant was we're staying in the parking garage of the Marine Reserve <laughs> barracks. And oh, big, my like, God. 
big, like six story parking garage. Um, and of course we're on like level four. So we're <laughs> hauling all of our shit up the ramp. And even, even people that live in new Orleans will tell you that that particular August and September was unbearably hot. It was uh. so hot and just incredibly humid. I mean, you, you couldn't walk five steps without just dripping with, you know, your clothes just being soaked. Yeah. We were, uh, we were in the parking garage sleeping. We, we didn't have cots or anything. We were just laying on the, the concrete in the parking stalls. <laughs> but you had access to the rec room. Somehow. Yeah. There was, there was an MWR room. And for some reason, I don't know if the whole parking garage had power, but this room did. Again, nothing had power. I don't, I don't know how there was power in this place, but there was a TV in there. It actually worked. And so um, I think it was the first night. Well, it couldn't have been the first night we were there. Whenever it was, we, we were in there, um, you know, flipping through the channels and trying to find something to watch. And I don't know if somebody knew that the show was going to be on or if somebody was just said, hey, let's check this out. My memory is that it was completely coincidence that we landed on the E channel at that specific time. And they were, you know, teasing the show and the, the promos before it saying that they were at Fort Bragg and, and whatever. And everybody's like, oh, let's check it out. And I'm thinking <laughs> I'm in the back, just kind of shrinking, <laughs> oh, sliding no. down the wall. Like, oh, my God, where's the exit? Yeah. The, the, the second uh, I came on, people just turned and looked at me like, oh, and I'm like, oh, no. Oh, my God. That is so <laughs> random. <laughs> That's hilarious. A little embarrassing. It's well, so weird. Me, no, I wasn't embarrassed about being on the show, but just, you know, that, that moment was just like, oh, God. So that's fun. So then um, I wasn't going to have you on until like you actually come to the mansion. But then we were looking at it and I'm, I'm like, wait, that's not until like season four. So we're like, no, we have to have Eddie come on now because we're, we're not going to get to season four forever. <laughs> <laughs> so but we, I mean, when you do when we do get to that episode, we definitely want to have you come back on and like talk about like what happened between that point and then and what it was like going to the mansion and all of that good stuff. So we'll get back to everything. But just to give everybody just like a little kind of um, cap on what you've done since then. How long were you in the army total? Total of eight years. And then how many tours did you do total? Five. And then um, you came back and you were living in San Francisco doing mortuary affairs for a while. Yeah. When, when I got back to San Francisco, got my uh, old job back, embalming and funeral directing and those things. And then um, you got married in Virginia City. <laughs> so you, you um, I have the three M's. You got uh, married, moved to Michigan and are a mortician. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Right now, I uh, after I moved to Michigan and... You know, I worked a couple years at a funeral home, but now I own my uh, own uh, mortuary trade services company. I have a contract with the medical examiner for a uh, couple counties, do trade embalming for funeral homes in the area and help with transportation and things like that. So doing pretty well. Awesome. Yeah. And you have um, tell. Oh, uh, tell everyone what it's called and the Instagram account in case they want to follow because you post uh, interesting things about the funeral business every once in a while. I try to. Yeah. The name of the company is Northern Michigan Mortuary Logistics and the Instagram, since it's such a long name, is NMML underscore LLC. All right. I think you might be off the hook. But uh, just for reference to Eddie um, was on my Ghost Magnet podcast and he does have ghost stories from um, his work being a mortician, which are really fun. Yeah. <laughs> I think you were episode like seven or something like that, like early on. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm an easy guest for you to get on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were an easy get. Thank okay. you so much, Eddie. Thank you for all your service and everything you've done. And thanks for coming on to share with everybody. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me on. Good seeing you again. You too. Right. Bye. 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 So how did you feel about the trip when you went out there? Anything we didn't cover with Eddie that you remember? Um, no, I mean, there were a lot of things, like I said in the interview with Eddie, that the show didn't cover. Like, we couldn't be do anything on Fort Bragg, seeing his mm -hmm. barracks, which would have been so cool to see yeah. the, the uh, museums and things like that that we went to. But, I mean, I think we did the best we could with, like, what we had. Because, like I said, it was a very no crew to skeleton crew on it. Yeah, but, I think it looked great, considering. But I do wish they would have shown, I felt like they only showed the beginning scenes with Eddie, and they didn't show when, like, everybody turned out late. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's kind of sad. Um, but it did kind of, it kind of was cool as an intimate scene, though. Yeah. Like, I think it really, I mean, it missed what was going on for sure. But I think it really captures like that family 
down home thing that I think is really special. Yeah. About this episode. I agree with that. Um, But I also felt like it could do two things. It could have that really intimate family scene and then also show that it was supporting the troops greater as well. Yeah. You could have shown like a shot like as you were leaving like, oh, wow. Like just a quick like. Yeah. Like bye God. Like saying bye to the whole crowd (laughs) and and the whole. Yeah. Yeah. The whole place like screaming bye back or something like that would have been cool. Just like a partying scene like that. Yeah. Even something that Mm -hmm. quick. Like I know when you're just like one one small crew and one camera it's impossible to film a room full of people but yeah just like a a parting shot like that would have been cool I liked Eddie's friend's t-shirt that said serial killer but it was cereal spelled like the (laughs) breakfast food (laughs) I don't know why but that that um play on words always makes me laugh like I love it oh me too it doesn't get old (laughs) Um, okay, so now we switch to the party, which they've been teasing since the beginning. Yeah, we need to really talk about the 4th of July party and how it was different from the other parties. Yeah. First of all, it was during the day. The others were at night. I don't remember when it got started. Was it like noon or 11? I feel like it was one. I feel like everything got started around one at the mansion. Yeah, Like nothing sense. earlier than one. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you guys, my favorite party at the mansion was 4th of July because it was the only one where I could kind of walk around and do my own thing. Every other time you had to sit at the table with half, which we've talked about that before, how it's not like it was horrible <laughs> sitting at the table. But at the same time, like you were kind of on and you were kind of playing host and you were posing for pictures and saying hi to people and acting like you knew people when you didn't because you wanted to be a good hostess and stuff like that. It wasn't, and yeah, we got wasted and stuff, but it wasn't truly like let your hair down and have fun. And for me, that's what the 4th of July party was. And I talked about that before and somebody chimed in and they're like, yeah, it was your Independence Day. And I'm like, it was. Wow, I didn't make that. blown. Yeah, I didn't make that connection either. Because Hef would just sit at the table with like two of his friends and play back. At Gammon and we were allowed to mingle like we didn't have like all eyes on us for once so I was running around drinking Midori sours playing <laughs> volleyball going down the slip and slide talking to people like yeah oh I love I loved the 4th of July party too like you said there was tons of freedom like we could walk around and mingle which gave me the chance to go talk to so many people like people that didn't always come up for um, buffet dinners but were up there a lot for parties and things like that like uh, Rich and Beth like mm-hmm. they didn't come for all the every single buffet dinner or movie but they would come for any events at the mansion and I loved hanging out with them so fun and just like it, the parties always bring like a lot of people that you don't see all the time so this gave us the opportunity to really go and talk to so many people yeah it was that party was a blast I love that party plus the slip and slides yeah which I know we've talked to death about but Mm -hmm. they are just so incredible And um, and then there was just like a lot of fun food out too. Like at the bigger parties, it's kind of fancy food, you know. Like it's a real buffet. I feel like there was like oh, there was like a crab huge legs. like seafood yeah. buffet and like gourmet cheeses, which is amazing. And right. like that blew my mind the first time I came to a mansion party is just seeing like the food spread. Yeah, but it's also not necessarily what you want to eat when you're getting trashed ass yeah and might barf later well and wearing (laughs) and and wearing the tiniest of lingerie like you just kind of want snack food like you want chips and dip and you want like something just to grab and go and that's what's fun about 4th of July is that they have like an ice cream cart and they have hamburgers and hot dogs yeah hamburgers they have a whole hot dog cart which is fun and then yeah you can order off like the menu with the hamburgers and things like that or they had like the buffet thing out for the 4th of July sorry not the menu thing um but they just and the, like fresh fruit and just like so much finger food and party food, in my opinion. So you're getting dressed and you say, I'm getting turned on. I can feel it because they're turning on your microphone pack yes. on your back because yes. this was still so early. Like we had just started filming. So like now when somebody hands me a microphone, I'm like flipping it on and tucking it back on my bra. But back then they were still like dressing us up like dolls with the microphones. Like here, we're going to pin your microphone here and we're going to move the wire are here and we're going to click it on the back and we're going to turn it on. Yeah. So you're standing there like a Barbie getting dressed. Independence Day Barbie. Yes. And they don't show, obviously, they don't show the sound man at all. But I'm telling Anastasia I'm getting turned on and I'm joking because I'm talking about the mic. But like 
they don't show that or clarify why I'd be standing with my torch going, I'm getting turned on. I know. It's like, so random. What? They're grasping for anything sexual at this point, I feel like. Yeah, totally. Um, and um, the Statue of Liberty costume, I think we talked about, um, but it's the third time I'm wearing it. And I say, I say in this that I need to revamp it. But I just wanted to clarify that this is like the third time I've worn this costume because... Um, Somebody said I never repeat any of my outfits or anything, and I just wanted to clarify. Oh, that. we are repeat offenders. <laughs> like, I mean, me too with my Playboy Bunny Fourth of July. Like, I wore that almost every year. Well, and when we were doing uh, photos for our Patreon scrapbook pages, where I was talking about, where I was showing like all the different um, Thanksgivings and all the different Christmases mm-hmm. and stuff, I repeat outfits. Like, the, my leaf dress, I think I wore three or four years in a row, and my mm-hmm. uh, white Barbie Christmas dress with the red poinsettias on it, I think I wore like three years in a row or two years in a row or something like that and it just kept coming up to the point where I felt like I had to write in the captions of those yes I'm repeating this outfit again <laughs> different year <laughs> but it is it is truly a different year yeah did you notice when we're going down the slip and slides and stuff that all the staff are standing around watching I didn't notice that that's funny they're probably scared shitless somebody is gonna bite it but even like kitchen staff and everything like everybody came out to be like what the hell is going on on the side hill I've got to see that's this happening so funny. because somebody's going to die out here and I want <laughs> I want to witness this <laughs> you know what I was thinking too one of the things I felt like the mansion staff were looking at is because even though I know this is the playboy mansion I know a lot of crazy stuff has gone on in the past but I feel like no one had really done stuff like that not in a really long time and not in most of the staff's lifetime that working at the mansion <laughs> of working at the mansion not yeah. the full lifetimes but like nobody had done anything like that like he was married for so many years and mm-hmm. there wasn't like these kind of things going on these sort of antics yeah nobody was weighing in with ideas the girlfriends before us weren't doing like crazy things like that around the mansion that I know of I think the girls before us didn't care about like life at the mansion or like how am I going to make this fun it's like they were just kind of there and which is fine if that's what you want to do but they were just kind of there like collecting a paycheck yeah and I know that you and I have talked about this in private before and stuff but I I just really felt like we brought a lot of fun new ideas to the mansion a hundred percent and just new life into the mansion yeah like I think it probably felt new and different to the staff like after Hef's marriage ended and then Brandy and the twins came along just because Hef's lifestyle in general changed so much yeah but then after that I think it was just girls who were kind of like a revolving door just collecting a paycheck not really showing up any more than they absolutely have to I would bet and this isn't because the staff isn't totally thoughtful they are but I would bet that the staff had a hard time remembering all their names in like the early days of like the seven girlfriends just because the revolving door was so crazy I would if I was working there like I bet there were secret cheat sheets that Hef didn't know about where they're like okay this is this girl and she's in this room this is this girl she looks different because her hair is two inches shorter like I, if I were working at the mansion I would need a cheat sheet during those years because it was just such a turnover yeah well and just to clarify I'm not suggesting that they didn't do fun things or that the parties still weren't cool or anything like that I'm just saying that we brought a lot of our own unique ideas to the mansion which I didn't see prior to even though I was like looking in kind of I never saw that kind of stuff going on before us yeah no I never heard of any like traditions anybody started like the only thing was like Brandy had the cookie night and that was it but I think in between Brandy and us nothing was added (laughs) I think it was just like yeah people didn't care Well, and then it goes into the fireworks and I wanted to talk about the fireworks too, because I feel like, um, was it Hef one of the only people that has a fireworks permit like that? I think in LA County, he was the only private firework permit. And these were not just like little fireworks that you put off in your backyard or whatever. These were like Disneyland style. I think he hired people who used to do the Disneyland fireworks. That's what I thought. And I was also going to say the vo- they there was this whole, like everybody would be seated and there was this voice that would come out of the speakers and it was the guy who hosted the Disneyland fireworks. Oh, that guy that Ashley knows? Yeah. He's Funny. the voice of the oh Disneyland fireworks. Like, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're about to watch the Disney spectacular, whatever they say, fireworks spectacular or whatever. I don't know what it's called. But they he did the mansion one 
ones too. And so it very felt, you already got like super nostalgic and you got that like tingling feeling inside because you're hearing that voice booming over the speakers and everyone's sitting and it's dark and stuff. And then they would start going and I would always bawl crying because they would they would like play the national anthem and like the, the um, fireworks were going off and it was just like so beautiful and so patriotic and for me so emotional. I know I'm the crybaby of the group, but like <laughs> so emotion, emotional. I'm not crying now. I'm just choking on myself. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, okay. You guys, if you're listening and you have ever seen Fantasmic at Disneyland, there's a scene where the person in the Mickey Mouse suit has points his fingers. And from each of his pointer fingers, like sparklers come out, like not just little sparklers like you hold, but like a big firework sparkler. So one year, I don't know if you remember this, Bridget, because I don't remember if it was like the first year or the second year, but they gave things for Hef to put on his fingers and start the fireworks show like he's Mickey in Fantasmic. I don't remember this. It must have been the first year because I remember Ashley was there and she stopped hanging out because like the mean girls were mean to her. But Mm. and I remember like Hef had these firework things on his fingers and then he goes to scratch his nose that the fireworks still on it and Roberta goes Hef we love you stop because he's like <laughs> pointing it like at his nose like it's ready to go off at any moment and it's and, and then he stood there and started the fireworks and it was random but yeah. probably not the safest thing that's probably why he didn't continue to do it that is so funny I know I, w- I don't think I was there that must have been the year before I came because yeah. I don't recall that at all no but I thought the fireworks were amazing and like I said just so emotional and patriotic and really uh, I thought that was a great way to end the episode well it was nice for the whole neighborhood oh, too sure. like everybody's just getting this good fourth of July fireworks show One thing I will say about 4th of July is there were two halves to that party. Like there was the daytime, fun in the sun, and then there was like a little break with like buffet dinner, and then you would go back out to watch the fireworks. And looking back, I feel like I should have taken a little more time with my hair and makeup in between those because it would always be me like down the slip and slide in the pool and then I would come back out for fireworks just looking like an absolute drowned rat and for the amount of photos we had taken I really should have taken like the extra hour to like blow dry my hair put on some makeup like I wish I would have done that not that looks are everything but just when you have all these pictures from a day you know I should have tried a little harder I think I know exactly what you're talking about But here's the thing, when you're like out there all day long from like one to six. And you're drinking and it's hot, you're tired. Yeah, it's hot and you're drinking and then you know you have until like from six to like nine to like whatever, you don't feel like showering and like redoing everything again and then going back out. But remember, um, in the early, early days, it used to be a party, like a, a party after <gasps> fireworks. Yes, that's when Crystal Camden got attacked. Yeah, so like, okay, so here's how it would go. Party outside all day long, then end up in buffet dinner, even though you've been eating all day long, there'd still be an established <laughs> buffet dinner that I was that still night. eating. <laughs> and then fireworks, and then people could just like linger, or do whatever until like nine o'clock was the, the fireworks. But then in the early days, after the fireworks, everybody, the, the great hall would turn into like a club and it would be a DJ and dancing and it would turn into like an actual party mm-hmm. until like two and three in the morning, whatever, like a normal party. Eventually they took out the after party though and it just ended it with fireworks. Like when fireworks were done, good night everybody. <laughs> yeah, and there was one year where me, you and Crystal Camden coordinated. I wore red, you wore white, she wore blue. And we were in the Great Hall dancing and one of the mean girls out of nowhere just like mauled her on the dance floor, just like pulled her down, tried to pull her top off. It was so random. Yeah, she was wearing like a bandeau style top. And so the girl, and I don't even know what happened. As far as I know, not one thing happened. This girl just like lost her mind for a second and just like wrestled with Crystal trying to pull that top down. It was so bizarre. They hit the bench 
I remember Ouch. they were like hitting the, they hit the bench and Crystal's just trying to like fend her off and hold her top on. And I, the whole time I was just staring in like absolute disbelief. Like, are they, are they just pl- fucking around? Like, are they playing here? Or is this for real? Like, cause it just, there was no confrontation. There mm-hmm. was no like bad blood other than what just generally was there. Yeah. You know, there was like nothing that happened that I know of to inspire this. So I was just like, what is, what is happening right now? Yeah, it was insane and just weird that somebody does something like that and they don't like you should have got kicked out for that. Like you don't just like physically attack somebody and like tear off their clothes in the middle of the great hall. Right. Well, I think that Hef wasn't there. I don't recall Hef being anywhere near and I don't think Crystal wanted to report it to him. Ugh. So he probably didn't know. I don't know. Yeah, you're probably right. But that's just an example of the stuff we were putting up with. <laughs> yeah. I was glad, though, when they got rid of, like, the the party afterwards. Because, like you said, we, like, are tired. We're, like, down there sloppy. And, we, like, all I do is I go upstairs and put on sweats because it gets really mm-hmm. cold. Even in July, in summertime, um, watching the fireworks, like, you get... Plus, you've been in the sun all day, so you're probably a little sunburnt and stuff, but you get really cold. So I just remember putting on, like, sweats and trying to be warm out there. Yeah, there's just something about being, like, outside drinking all day. Like, you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Like, back when I had a show in Vegas, I would always call Sundays Rehab Sundays because they used to have this pool party at Hard Rock called Rehab. And that was kind of like the first big pool party in Vegas. And on Sunday nights, all the time in the show, you would see people just nodding off in the audience. And it was not a reflection of the show at all. It was just like, I knew what everybody had been doing all day. They'd been out in the sun, getting wasted at the pool. And you can't stay awake after you've been doing that. Yeah, it zaps you. Between the sun and the alcohol, you are zapped. Yeah. Okay, so now that we've gone through that whole episode, best and worst, what would you change and what was your favorite? Oh, God. Okay. I, always, I, I forgot about, what mine were. I need to think about it for a second. I always forget tell. that we're doing this thing and I never prepare. Especially when we do a two-parter. Oh, yeah, it's true. Then I have to remember, like, what was the first half of this again? Um, well, obviously, my my favorite part of this episode is going to be going to see my brother and mm-hmm. all that. Um, my least favorite part has got to be that awkward scene with Hef with, uh, talking about my sister or he wasn't talking about my sister being naked, but Hef like doing that little gallop with my sister being naked in the other room. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's cringy and embarrassing. And it's embarrassing too, because something like that happens that's kind of inappropriate. And it's just, we don't know what to do. So we're just kind of standing there awkwardly laughing. But I feel like it kind of makes us look like shit too. Like if somebody's watching it with no context, they're like, ew, you girls think it's funny? We didn't. Yeah. And it doesn't even really sink in until you see it played back too. And years later, because I feel like at the time I thought, oh, he's just, he's just joking like he wasn't really trying to see anything or anything Mm -hmm. like that like he's just kidding so I didn't think a lot of it but watching it back this many years later I'm like it doesn't matter you don't you just don't even kid about that yeah it's gross I mean I can think of more best and worse than this one too like just even the body shaming with the Audra scene is one of the worst things um because it's just it was it was out of spite for the the bag thing it was it was deliberately put in there to make her look bad just knowing where it's coming from too is extra bad yeah I think I agree with everything you said but just to add extra stuff I think my personal best and worst is my worst like if I could change anything it's like give me credit for doing Operation Playmate like I don't know why they made a point of like making it look like that's not something I do and that's not like a responsibility of mine. Well, then you might have a personality, Holly. I know. I mean, what would we do with that? (laughs) (laughs) And I think my favorite thing overall was the fact that we were all getting along really well. Like, even Kendra in her interviews is, like, being careful, like, to say nice things and not offend anybody. And, I mean, they pit me and Kendra against each other a little bit because they try to make it look like I'm really annoyed that she won't wear the bunny costume when in reality I don't give a shit. But that's a joke that everybody was in on. Yeah. I mean, I call and it I a don't joke, mind it. Yeah. but whatever you want to call it, like Kendra knew that she wasn't going to wear it. Yeah. You knew she wasn't going to mm-hmm. wear it. I knew she wasn't going to wear it. Audra and Jillian, who are the replacements or one of them was a replacement. Yeah. Jillian, I guess, knew Kendra wasn't going to wear it. That's mm-hmm. the reason she's there and ready. Um, so we all knew we were all in on that setup scene. Yeah. And I think this is a good example of an episode where like we haven't been turned in on each other yet. I mean, things will change down the road, but at this point in time, everybody's getting along. Yeah. 
I think we 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 really detailed that episode well. I think so. <laughs> well, patting ourselves on the back. Like, <laughs> no, we did get on that one. So we will have a fun episode for you guys next week. And also be sure and get your ticket for our live podcast with Moment. That's going to be on February 9th. It's 6 p.m. Pacific time. And we're going to be going over all the blind items, all the urban legends, all the rumors about the Playboy world. Plus, we'll have a little after party with a live Q&A after if you want to be part of that as well. Yeah, and if you are on our Patreon, you can send us questions to and things like that if uh, we will take a look at those and see if there's anything we can answer on the moment. Yes, so we will see you guys next week. Bye, guys.